he wanted to do it for gladiators. And so he wanted to be the guy that would fix the gladiators up after they fought. And, and so he decided this would be his life's work. And so he went to the tryouts, essentially, to be a doctor. And Galen was kind of a crazy guy. And so he brought with him a Barbary macaque, one of these creatures. And he's standing in front of the other doctors. And, and he cuts the Barbary macaque right down its front and guts it. And, and says to the other doctors, if you can sew this back up, you should have the job. Otherwise, it's mine. <laughs> and history is unclear whether he got the job because he could sew it back up or because all the other doctors thought he was crazy and just left him be. <laughs> but he did get the job, and he proceeded to make many of the first discoveries about how our cardiovascular system works. And he did it in part by looking at the gladiators. The gladiators would get cut open, and he would have this unique view of what was going on in the body. And it won't dwell on that, but he got things wrong, right? So he imagined all the food comes from the, um, you know, our intestines, the digestion goes through the liver, and the blood is made in the liver, and then goes through the circulatory system. But he didn't know it circulated. He imagined it was unidirectional, that there was this endless supply that went through. And people tend to make fun of him now, that he didn't understand it, they didn't get it. But the truth is, he figured out most of what was going on, and maybe if he had a few more years, he would have gotten it, or the next of his students would have figured it out. Instead, what happened was the fall of Rome. And with the fall of Rome, this, this, the practice of medicine and science, they all sort of fall apart. And it's become unpopular to talk about the fall of Rome uh, among historians, to talk about it as the Dark Ages. But from the perspective of the heart, it really was the Dark Ages. And so between Galen's death in the 1400s, no new knowledge about the heart accumulated. That was it. And in fact, most of what happened is that people forgot things. And so if you looked at, say, say, 400, people knew less than in 200. In 800, they knew less than in 400. And so by the time that da Vinci started to work on, on art initially, there was actually less known, much less than in Galen's time. And so he had to rediscover things. And da Vinci was rediscovering things not because he wanted to be a scientist, but because he wanted to paint the truth. And he was fascinated with the world all around him. He was fascinated with movement. This is a, a drawing of a flood. This is a self-portrait. I love that this, the flood and the self-portrait sort of look about the same, right? He liked how things <laughs> move. But he also liked trying to understand how the body worked. And other painters also did dissections. So Michelangelo did dissections. But da Vinci was somehow more focused, more obsessive, more serious about it. And it's probably as a consequence of this that da Vinci did very few paintings. He would get a commission. And then he would spend 10 years doing the commission because he would have to dissect a bunch of bodies, then he would have to go find a cow. Um, and, and so he did a lot, a lot of other things in that time that helped us understand the world, at least could have. And some of what he did in terms of painting and drawing and dissection was incredibly detailed. And so this is an aortic valve that's drawn by da Vinci, right? And so you can see it has these three pieces. I can't, I don't have the right number of hands for this, but imagine I had a third hand, and they go like this, and they lock up. This is a modern drawing of an aortic valve. And so you can see, doing this by candlelight, he gets it essentially right, which to me is totally amazing. And this is what it looks like in action. This is a big aortic valve. And one of the mysteries about an aortic valve like this one is how it closes, right? So it opens when the blood flows through, but it's not muscular. It's got nothing to pull itself back shut. And we can look at this now and think, oh, what a neat mystery. But somehow Da Vinci, in, in, in a stinking basement where he was dissecting cows and humans, thought this was an interesting mystery, too. And so when Da Vinci went to think about this, he thought again about his rivers. And he remembered that when he'd drawn rivers, that he'd seen these vortices, especially if the river started narrow and then got wider. And so he thought, well, maybe what's happening is that in these valves, because it starts narrower and then it has these little sinuses on the other side, that it too is generating a vortex, a little eddy, and that that's pushing the valve closed. And amazingly, and we don't quite understand how he did it, Da Vinci actually made a replica valve of the heart, of the aortic valve. He made it out of glass, and somehow he made these little two little valves, and then he would pour seeds into it to see how the seeds move. And so this is a drawing of what he saw, right? So he actually sees these eddies pushing on these, these little valves. 
And so this is amazing to me, right, that he could do this. What's most amazing is that nobody else would do this again until 1969. And when they did it in 1969, they had no idea that he'd done it before. And so this is a discovery that's made in 1480, and then it's made again in 1969 using fancy computer models. Well, this is the slightly more recent version, showing exactly the same thing. In fact, I actually think DaVinci's is nicer. But to me, that's amazing, right? That is. And, uh, and it wasn't just this. He did other things, too. And so, when he was dissecting people, often there were people who died tragic deaths. And so you would have people that suffered from smallpox, plague, cholera. And, and, and so he dissected these young people that suffered tragic deaths. But then one day he's talking to an old man. He thinks he's in his 80s. And all of a sudden the old man dies right in front of him. And da Vinci thinks, oh, what an opportunity <laughs> to dissect a fresh old man. And to understand, not a terrible death, but a pleasant death. To understand, as a well-spent day brings happy sleep, so life well used brings happy death. What causes a happy death? And so he takes this guy into the basement of the church and starts dissecting. And the first day he smells okay, the second day he smells worse, about a week into it he's smelling really bad, but Da Vinci has no idea what might have killed him, and so he has to go through everything. And as he's doing this, He's thinking again about his rivers. He's thinking about how water moves back and forth in rivers. And he's thinking about his other dissections of other people. And that's when he finds these arteries that are twisted like this. And inside those arteries, the buildup of what we now call plaque. And he says that this buildup and this twistedness of the artery, like an old river, must lead it to move in a different way and prevent nutrition from moving through the body. He essentially has discovered atherosclerosis, the cause of most heart disease. All of this in the late 1400s, early 1500s. The sad part about this story is that none of this was passed down to anybody. Because when da Vinci died, he'd written no great book he was going to but didn't get around to it. And he left this guy, his pupil, Francesco Melzi, to pull together his great treatise on anatomy. Now imagine, you know, one of your professors leaves and you're in charge of writing all the great thoughts they ever had. <laughs> the first thing you're not going to know is, were, were those thoughts really good or did they just tell you they were good? Yeah. Right? And you're going to be suspicious. I mean, not all lectures are great. You know, maybe they're a little bit crazy. And so Melzi starts to read Da Vinci's letters and it's worse than that because they're written backwards. Da Vinci made up a bunch of secret words that nobody else knew. And half of what he did, nobody else understood. And so Melzi didn't do it. And so basically, all of Da Vinci's knowledge was lost to slowly be rediscovered only beginning in the 1800s. And so nobody would rediscover atherosclerosis until the 1800s. Nobody would discover that heart valve until the 19, late 1960s. And in fact, the entire study of the heart moves super slowly for the next 500 years. So much so that the very first heart surgery, which I think we think of as a relatively old thing, doesn't happen until the late 1890s. And it was done by this guy, uh, Daniel Hale Williams, at Providence Hospital in Chicago. Hale Williams, super interesting guy, uh, Native American, African American, moves to Chicago, starts to work as a doctor, and finds that among his friends are many people whose children want to be nurses, but can't be. African Americans who can't be trained in Chicago. So he decides to start a hospital that would train African American nurses. And, he, and so he does this. And it's this amazing hospital that ends up training both nurses and doctors. It's in an old house. And it, does, it has all sorts of firsts, in part because it's dealing with rough conditions and they've got to do what other hospitals can't do. They have to make do with what they have. And then in 1893, the World's Fair comes to Chicago and every imaginable kind of terrible thing that can happen to a person happens to them. And so the hospital is full of all these weird cases. And then more ordinary ones, like this guy, James Cornish, who was out with his friends at a bar listening to music, and he stands up and somebody stabs him. 
And so he ends up at the hospital, and it becomes clear that he stabbed wound is to the chest, and it's right where his heart is. And as, as time goes on, it becomes more and more clear that he's probably been stabbed directly in the heart. Which is a problem because in the entire history of humans, although brain surgery goes back 2,000 years, no one's ever operated on a heart. And so Williams is in this situation where he knows that the problem that Cornish faces is one that nobody's ever tried to heal. And yet Cornish is here and he either has to do something or watch him fade. And he has on his shelf at this point the standard textbook for all surgeons that tells him what he should do. And it's very clear. Surgery of the heart has probably reached the limits set by nature to all surgery. No new method and no new discovery can overcome the natural difficulties that attend a wound of the heart. Which is to say, don't touch him. Don't touch him. <laughs> Um, but Williams touched him. He decided that he was going to go in and operate. And so he opened up the chest for the first time ever. He sees the heart. He's paralyzed with, with, the, with this emotion of seeing a beating heart. And you can see that the, the, the sac around the heart, the pericardium, is cut. The heart muscle itself is not, which kind of saves him. So he looks at the heart. He holds it. He stitches the pericardium back together. He seals Cornish back up, and Cornish lives and goes home. Wow. He would then get stabbed again 20 years later and come back. <laughs> and once again, Williams sutured him up. And so this is the first heart surgery in the world. And it's very recent. And it helped that it was a time period in which most of the wounds were knife wounds. And so um, there were relatively, they ended up being relatively clean wounds. There wasn't a lot of infection coming out of the knife, and they were just sealed back up. And the heart sort of the pressure of the muscle seals them a little bit. Um, later on, infection rates will be much harder, higher with other kinds of wounds. But early successes were actually pretty good. But the, the, there were tons of challenges. And so anesthesia was one. Another is you couldn't stop the heart. And so with the pericardium, it's not, you know, there's a little bit of give. But with the heart muscle itself, here's this animal that's leaping out at you while you try to stitch it. Um, and, and, and so the next challenge was trying to see the heart. I mean, there were, and the guy who did this was also, I mean, just pretty amazing character. His name is Werner Forsman. And one day he's at a bar in Germany, and he says to his friend, I want to put a catheter into someone's vein so I can see their heart. And this is in 1930. It's decades before angiograms. And his friends all buy him another beer and tell him to go back to his madness. He goes to work the next day. And well, I was just going to say, this is what inspired him, is that somebody had done this with a horse. And a horse, a catheter to put up into the heart to measure blood pressure. And so this was a big deal. He carried this picture around in his pocket all the time. But he goes back to work and he tells his boss, I'm going to take a catheter. And the only catheter available was a... Um, a urethral catheter, so it's giant, and I want to put it through someone's vein into their heart because one day we might be able to diagnose heart problems this way. And he'd spent lots of time with cadavers, so he'd seen all these heart problems that nobody could cure. And in part, nobody could cure them because you couldn't even see them when people, patients were alive. And his boss, of course, said no. And he said, well, I'll do it on myself. And his boss said, no, why don't you get a rabbit? And so Forsman thought about it for a while, and he thought, no, I'm going to do it on myself. And so he went back to work, and he convinced a nurse that she could be part of his team and that they could do it together, and that he would put the catheter in her vein up into her heart, and that way he wouldn't defy his boss. And so she said, yeah, okay, let's do it, which suggests that he was a very compelling character, right? <laughs> But what he really needed was that he was so low on the totem pole at the hospital, he didn't have access to the cabinet to get the catheter out of the cabinet. So we had to have her. Um, so he straps her up uh, to get ready for this procedure. And then when she's all ready and turned away, he starts to put the catheter in its own vein. And it's this giant catheter, and he flinches because it hurts, and he puts it up, and it goes up, 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 and it gets close to his heart, which is when he realizes they've chosen their, the wrong room and there's no x-ray. Oh, boy. And so they're now going to walk down two flights of stairs with a catheter bobbing in his heart. 
and he gets to the place where he can take an x-ray and his friend is there and his friend says, Werner, you're crazy, and starts to try to rip the catheter out. And he runs to the x-ray and sees it's not all the way to his heart. He shoves it up further. And this is it. Good. Wow. Oh, wow. And he goes to his boss, and, his, and his, you know, he expects to be greeted with recognition. And he has, his boss says, this is great. And then for the next 20 years, what greets him is total marginalization. Everybody thought he was crazy. Nobody would hire him. Then... This procedure, without him knowing it, moves to the U.S. and starts to become a common, and eventually it becomes associated with injecting dye into the heart. And then once you inject dye into the heart, you can actually, you know, you can take a kind of picture of where the dye is, and you can see the, the ventricles, the, the, the atria, and even the coronary arteries eventually. He has no idea that this has happened because he's so marginal. And then one day he's in the bar again, and his wife calls, and she says, call home. Come home, somebody funny called, and it's late at night. He says, nah, I'm drinking. And, and so, so then he goes home, and somebody funny calls, and they have a funny accent, and he hangs up the phone. And then he goes to work the next day, which is when he finds out that he's won the Nobel Prize. Um, and so this was his final, you know, finally victorious. And this is actually his son sent this to me. It's a copy of the prize letter. Telegram. And so once this happens, all, all sorts of doctors all around the world start to imagine wilder and wilder things that can happen in the heart. World War II goes by, and after World War II is a time of technology. We're going to go to the moon, we're going to do everything that you could possibly imagine through technology. And so it becomes this time when people imagine that the body is this simple thing, technology is fancy, we can just replace the parts of the body. And so this is where the, one of the very biggest scientific programs in the history of the U.S. is launched to build a nuclear-powered replacement heart. <laughs> this does not work. <laughs> surprise, surprise. It's an emblem of how, how much of a belief we had in the power of technology, right? The Russians actually made a nuclear-powered pacemaker, and there's still people walking around with those in parts of Russia. Um, but the other interesting thing about this is that as this technology progresses, the limits end up being not so much the technology, but our understanding of biology. And this comes in many interesting forms. One of my favorite is this zombie ant that we're going to get to. It turns out that success in some of these procedures would depend on these zombie curves. And one of the places is not in artificial hearts, but in a heart transplants. This guy the first heart transplant recipient. At this moment, he had the heart of an 18-year-old girl beating in his chest, and he lived. And when this happened, it was front pages of newspapers all around the world. Christian Barnard, who did it, was a superhero. He then went on to date movie stars. <laughs> um, what it was not heroic, there he is, looking fancy and handsome. What was not heroic was that the patient lived just 18 days. And what would happen over the next 20 years is that all around the world, people would be, try to be the first to do a heart transplant, first in the U.S., first in New Jersey, first in southern New Jersey, and none of those patients lived very long. In fact, it's now estimated that those patients lived less time with their transplanted hearts than they would if they never went into the hospital. And the reason is knowable, and it was known then. And the reason is that the body was rejecting the hearts, and there were no immunosuppressants to keep the body from rejecting the heart. And then at this point, a compound is discovered in a soil fungus called cyclosporine that suppresses the immune system and makes heart transplants possible. And so then they become common. And so probably you've met somebody with a heart transplant, you probably wouldn't even know it. There's somebody in this room. But the amazing thing about this is after it was discovered, Nobody studied it again. Nothing. It was discovered, the compound became commercial, they sold it. Nobody ever inquired about why does this organism produce it in the first place. And then my friend Kathy Hodge at Cornell University, she went into a museum collection collected by students of fungi. And she found this great fungus that was growing out of a beetle larvae that was in cow poop. Because she's a professor, and 
She said, well, what would be more fun to do on my weekend? And I'll try to grow this and figure out what it is. Professors do funny things, right? Yeah, that's about that was, <laughs> Why was it the professors who said that? <laughs> so, and so she grows it out, and there are three amazing things. One is that it grows, right? It's been in a collection forever, but just an amazing feature of fungi. The second is she can identify it, and it's the same fungus that produces cyclosporin. The third thing that's amazing is it's a cordyceps fungus. Cordyceps fungi take over the brains of insects and make them do crazy things that benefit the fungus. And so, for example, they make ants climb really high so that the fungus can disperse. They take over the brains of beetles and make them crawl into cow poop so that the fungus can get to the cow poop. In order to do that, they also suppress the immune systems of the insects. And so it's not clear that the reason this worked as an immunosuppressant in humans is that actually that's its, that's its lifestyle. It suppresses immune systems. And so this now suggests where we can look for many more immunosuppressants. And nobody had even looked. And so to me, that's a really important story about how much we don't know even when we think we've made the big discovery. Another interesting thing in the heart transplant context is the first heart transplant was not a, into a human was not a human heart. It was a heart transplanted by this guy, James Hardy, from a baboon into a person. Um, and it was too small, and the patient, it was said, um, was in too bad a condition, and so it did not succeed. But it has been thought by the medical literature for, the whole, for until now that that was the only reason it didn't succeed. Um, and we worked on it again, but there wasn't actually an obvious reason not to, other than ethical reasons. But what nobody had actually looked at is how similar are baboon and human hearts. It had actually not been very well studied. Kind of thing you'd want to do beforehand, not after. <laughs> it didn't seem to occur to anyone. We know that humans and other primates share many of their genes, most of their genes, if we're talking about apes. And so to the extent that anybody thought about this, they assumed that the hearts would be the same. In 2011, somebody checked for the first time in a detailed way, and what they found was the fact that the hearts of humans and other primates differ greatly. And one of the ways they seem to differ most is in how they break. And so this, these are the coronary arteries of a human heart. These are the arteries that clog when you get heart disease. They, they clog, and so the oxygen does not get provided to the heart, and the heart essentially starves. The heart needs tons of oxygen. Well, that's how we die. It was long thought that when chimps had heart attacks, which they do have, that that's how they were dying too. This is a really dramatic scene of Lucy and her friends looking on. And what makes the chimp seem more similar to us than a scene like this? You know, it died of a heart attack like we do, and then its friends were sad, except when you look at the heart. Because it turns out, this is a normal healthy heart tissue, that although we get atherosclerosis, chimps don't. Instead, chimps die of a totally different kind of heart attack that we don't get. And no one had ever noticed until 2011. And so this opens up a totally new question of why we suffer these different kinds of heart attacks. It's still not really resolved. What people first speculated is the chimps didn't have high cholesterol. You know, they're eating that good green diet, lots of kale and stuff. But in fact, it turns out the chimps have about the same cholesterol levels as you know, somebody eating Big Macs. In fact, it's a little bit worse. And so it's something fundamental about the chimp heart immune system and cardiovascular system, and people have really just started looking, which to me is amazing. Other comparative thing that I think is amazing is that most mammals, including baboons and chimps, get about a billion heartbeats in their, in their lives. And so you can feel your carotid artery, you can feel that beat, about a billion of those, which is a lot, right? That's a lot of times for the heart to work. If you look across organisms, that's really, really consistent. You know, this is number of beats per minute. This is life expectancy. If you're a shrew and you get 700 beats per minute, the entirety of your life is going to go pretty quick. If you're a whale and your heartbeat goes like this, boom. Can't wait quite that long. You get boom. <laughs> you get lots of years, right? And so this is super interesting to me. And one of the things that suggests is if you knew about these organisms up here that get extra life, that those are really interesting to study in terms of their longevity. What kind of fountain of youth do they have? 
It turns out that the organisms down here include lots of marsupials. The poor suckers just don't get as many beets. Um, <laughs> And it tur turns out that you can actually study this and look at these organisms and find useful things. And so it turns out that ground squirrels live longer than they should. And that they're doing this because they slow down their heart rate in the winter. And so they essentially buy themselves time. And in studying ground squirrels, people have found they do this with adenosine, which has been used clinically for a while to slow down hearts. And so now people are studying how the ground squirrels do it in order to do this in a more useful way in hospitals. But the other interesting thing to me is that if we put humans on this, this is the historic human life expectancy. This is where we are now. And so we get, if we're lucky, about a billion and a half extra heartbeats. And these are extra heartbeats we get because of public health. We get them because of modern medicine. We get them because of all this work in the last hundred years, but we don't get them equally. And so one of the really important lessons for humans you know, is, is that most of medical research focuses on getting this up a little higher. But the truth is, the reality is, if we want to spend our work well, we need to get everybody up from here to there. Because much of the world is still on this line, right? From all that history of fancy things and plutonium hearts, they've gotten no extra beats. And my last point is that as we look at these hearts, that these extra beats come from hearts that we're really just beginning to understand. So how many of you are interested in medicine in one way or another? So I would say that there are more discoveries in your generation in terms of the basic functioning of our bodies than there have ever been. We have cooler tools and we're just as ignorant. <laughs> and we always feel like we aren't, right? We always feel like the smart ones. We look back at Galen and he got circulation wrong, that dope working without <laughs> anesthesia or any modern things. But that's how we'll be looked at, too. And when that changes, when we learn these things that seem impossible now, it's going to be your generation that figures them out. And so I think it's an incredibly auspicious moment in which to think about, yeah, please. Yeah, I was wondering, you know, women on an average live longer than men, so they're getting those extra beats from public. Yeah, women also have slightly slower uh, heart rates on average. And so, so they're getting a few extra beats, but not as many if you don't count in. Um, I think there's a difference of about what, six, seven years. Uh, yeah. Like that. So maybe they need to study this. Yeah, I mean, so there are all these, I mean, so I think that, I mean, even just a super simple figure like this, and if we put hum, the human story on this, most of what's going on in that figure is really important and we have no idea what's causing it. 